Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. We're so glad you could join us today. My name is Rick Bowling. I'm the pastor at Westview. And today we're going to be talking about greater things from the scripture. But first, let me, just a couple of housekeeping things. We would uh, certainly encourage and enjoy uh, and appreciate if you are interested in contributing to the ministry at Westview uh, to do that. And you may do so by going on our, our website, wbcshelby.org. We certainly thank you for doing that. So today we're going to be talking about greater things. And, you know, when you think of greater things, what do you think about? You think about, you know, something that is, is pretty magnificent, grandiose, and uh, from the world standpoint, people who do great things. There's all kinds of ways to look at this, but today we're going to see it from a little different vantage point because this is coming from God's view. His view is always different than ours. I think of a, a person I knew in a former ministry. Um, this person had come to one of our celebrations uh, early on in the ministry when I was there, and the Lord had really touched their heart um, in a, a very specific way. Uh, they had been to church, they had gotten saved at earlier age, but they had just kind of fallen off the beaten path and been choked out by the thorns of life. And so suddenly um, they were stoked inside. The Lord really meant something in a deeper uh, place in their lives than it ever had before. And they decided they really truly wanted to follow Jesus. Now, interesting thing about this person, this person came from very little means, um, grew up in a, in a difficult family situation, uh, had never had support by family and uh, and now you know they they had their own family but yet trying to struggle about how to be a parent and and, and a spouse and and just to, to move forward in life well as god does he this person uh they felt um you know less than important un unfortunately but but nevertheless they followed god and they these were things they wanted to grow in and they wanted to share their faith with other people and so as we see, as I think about that story, that person had others that came along that the Lord sent, and they began to blossom and to flourish, but it was in following Christ and, and, and studying his word and, and just growing that I began to see this person um, just grow in, in, in the relationship with the Lord and uh, sharing his love with other people. It was really cool to see over time, and a lot of things happened with that. Uh, and so God took something that the world would call ordinary and he transformed it and used it for a greater purpose. I've seen it in our very own church as well with people here um, at the current ministry at Westview. And so today we're going to be looking at in the scriptures. Let's look at um, John chapter 1. That's where we're going to be studying. And we're going to be looking at uh, starting with verses 43 through 51. Now, this first section, I'm going to read these first three verses. I call it finders, keepers. You remember that old saying, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Okay, so finders, keepers. Um, it's kind of interesting as we open up, uh, we see the picture here is Philip. And it, 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 Jesus talks about um, the next day he decided to leave for Galilee from where he was. And, and so finding Philip, he says to him, follow me. Follow me, Philip. And simply Philip does that. Now, who is Philip? In the scriptures, we see different um, places where Philip enters into. John chapter 6, we see this uh, place where they were feeding the 5,000. And uh, and Jesus, you know, he's kind of testing the disciples there, and, and he begins to ask some questions, and he's like, well, you know, um, how are we going to feed them? And, and here Philip is, and he's like, well, you know, we don't even have a half a day's wages, there's no way to feed all these people, so to speak. So we see that that simple response to the practical that Philip is is there. And then another time some Greeks come to Philip and they're like, uh, John chapter 12, and he's they're asking him, he said, well, you know, we'd like to ask this Jesus some questions. And he says, well, um, I need to go and consult with Andrew. He need to go ask him. He wasn't sure about that. You know, of course, Greeks were unclean and so forth, but and then finally in John uh, chapter 14, uh, a, a very familiar passage for a lot of people. Uh, in John 14, 6, um, Jesus says to him, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. And so uh, at that point, Philip goes. <laughs> he says to them, he says, well, Jesus, just show us the Father. He's trying to speak for all the other disciples there. 
And again, in that practical, ordinary ways, um, some of the theologians uh, and Bible scholars, you know, they think Philip that, you know, that that he was maybe just simple, maybe it could be limited a little bit, but God was choosing the ordinary. And he was showing that even, and he chose others, but he's showing that he can do greater things. And as you'll see in this passage, he continues to build on this idea as he goes. So that's the, that's the introduction to that. But but let's let's look what's next. This next verse, you you could read right over this. If you've read the scripture, you may have read over it several times. It, it meant nothing to you. We think, well, okay, this is just where he's from. He says, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, he was from the town of Bethesda. Now, why is that significant? I, I, you know, what we're going to see here is God finds the greatest and calls the greatest sometimes of those from the worst circumstances. I mean, think about it for just a minute. If you are walking along and you've done it, I've done it, you walk into a spider web and suddenly, uh, what's the first thing you do? You start flailing around, you're trying to get, get it off of you, you're brushing it. And the second thing you're going, wait a minute, with a spider web, there's spiders. And so then you're looking all over because you don't want to be bitten by a spider. And then what's the last thing? Then you start looking around if you're in a public place. Did anybody see that? And it's like, you know, it's kind of a uh, one of those situations, you know, you don't want to be bit by a spider. That's a pretty bad situation. And, uh, and, and you're worried about what, what others might think about you. Well, here is Andrew from Bethesda, the place where uh, supposedly it, the, Jesus, it says in John, uh, Matthew 11, verse 20, says that he did many miracles there. And yet, and he mentioned a couple other cities, but Bethesda was one of them, and there was basically no repentance. And so he's calling these people who could be, in, you know, in a pretty bad situation. They had this, the, the uh, spider of sin, so to speak, all over them and uh, all around them. And yet these, Philip chose to follow Jesus. Now, notice what he said in verse 43. It says that Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He found Philip. It's one of the places, I don't even know if there's another place where it says Jesus found somebody. Now, he finds off, we know that God sent him to us. And so he found us when, in that way. But it's kind of unique that he went and found a, a person of this nature and this stature, to, I believe, to prove a point. Well, what happens next? As we look in the scripture, it says that Philip found, okay, so God found him, found Philip. Now it says Philip found Nathaniel, and he told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so what we see is that, that just like Philip was like a torch that had been lit, and one lighted torch serves to light another as as uh, Godet says, and he says, and so that's exactly what we see happening. He's lighting the torch of Nathaniel. Now, why is it important for us to meditate, to read, to dwell on the scriptures? Look what it says right there in the second part of that. We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. So what we see is that Philip, uh, like Andrew is indicating, they knew the Torah, they knew the law, they knew the scriptures that had been written so far, and it was important. And now they could see that Jesus, this Jesus that has come, this is the one that was the object, the goal of, of all the prophets, the prophecy of, from the Old Testament. Let me tell you, finders, keepers, they were, Jesus had found them, and, and they, he was keeping them, and they were going to keep him, it looked like, right here. Well, as we see that picture, it doesn't just stop. He's still building there. Because the second thing I want you to see in the next few verses is there's a great invitation when we see these greater things that are taking place. Look at verse 46. So, Nathaniel, here he is. You know, Philip has just given him uh, this uh, invitation to come and, uh, and to, to see Jesus. And that they had found him. And what does he say? But Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
And so what we see here is that, that less is more. I want you to see that for just a minute. Less is greater. Remember, Jesus has this upside-down approach. God does that, if you will. It's like the, the bottom-up coming from the bottom-up versus the top-down. You know, the top-down is all about the leader. And Jesus, know, we know that he came to serve, um, as we see in the scriptures over and over. He tells us that. But he also, he came from Nazareth. And why is this significant? Because Nazareth was an insignificant village. What do I mean by that? It didn't mean it. It, it, did, it didn't have the, the importance of these major cities and ports. It was a village with ordinary villagers. They were living off the land and the cattle and, and they, you know, just hoping to get through life without much trouble. And so you see how he's painting that picture that less is greater. And what does he do? I love what, what uh, Philip says to Nathaniel. Again, in that simple, ordinary way of who he is. He could have rationalized with him. He could have given him, you know, all the, um, he gave him the proof of what the scripture, but, you know, he, he didn't try to um, have this intellectual conversation. He just simply did what a lot of the Jewish people did, the rabbis would do. It was a formula that they did. It was about uh, uh, seeking out solutions together. He says simply, come and see, Nathaniel, come and see. Well, so this is what he says from there in verse 47. It says, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, so here he is, he's coming. You know, it kind of reminds me of the, the prodigal uh, son and the father when he sees his son coming. But anyway, this is what he says. Here, he says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. No deceit. Now that's a, I mean, we know Nathaniel, was, he was not perfect, he was human. But why would he say that? I mean, no deceit, in, in the Greek, that means uh, no bait was used. Deceit means it, it, something is just like it, the metaphor for fishing. Um, I think of the time, uh, it was kind of interesting when I was, just before I came to Westview, and the Lord had really been putting on my heart to pray for this church. And, uh, and, that weekend before I made a phone call to tell someone that I've been praying for them, I had gone fishing with my father. And uh, we were down at, at, at uh, Lake Murray around Newberry, South Carolina. And, and we had a guide with us. And he had three fishing rods for each one of them. Why three rods? Each one of them had a different form of either lure or uh, if it was something live like a worm. But I think it was all artificial lures. But it was a bait. And so one was for, for fishing on the bottom. One was for trolling, which would go down into the water, you know, at a certain depth. And then one's one what we call top water. And all of them were a bait to catch the fish. In fact, he said, use the top water. He said, if you see the, the water rippling all of a sudden, we're going to stop, grab that one with the top water. He showed which one it was. And cast over the top and just start reeling. And they'll hit it like crazy and some of it will hook. It was, and sure enough, he was right. And, uh, but, you know, it was a way to trick, obviously, the fish into taking the bait. Uh, no deceit, not like Jacob in the Old Testament. You know, his name was Deceiver, and he deceived Esau, and, and we see that. He says, no, he says, you are a true son of Israel. Now, you know, this is a, something that I don't, you know, I've read this before, but it just really popped out to me when I saw it this time. Romans chapter 2, verse 29. I'm going to read that straight from the scriptures. It's worth reading. This is what Paul says, a true Israelite. He says, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. In other words, not by the law, he's saying. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. And that's how... God, uh, Jesus is describing Nathaniel to himself. He sees him there. Uh, he says, I, I, you know, I know this, this person. I saw you sitting under the tree, as he says. Let's see where, uh, he says, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. He says, well, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. And Jesus says, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you. 
Well, the fig tree, you know, is a, a symbol. Uh, we see there back of, of like of home or like your own home. Isaiah, um, Zechariah, Micah, it, there's several references to that of being sitting under your fig tree. It was a place that people would come and, and they would sit before the Lord and it was just a place to, to meditate quite a bit as well. And so, you know, I think that's pretty powerful image as we see there. But what is Jesus saying in this? He's saying, I know everything. I know everything about you. Uh, as we see in the scripture, <laughs> he says, uh, yeah, I saw you while you were still in the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, Jesus has, we see in the scriptures many different places uh, are where Jesus talks about and the Lord talks about his knowledge of us. Just over in the next chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 24, he says, But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And in fact, that was just a, coming really from a, a negative standpoint, but he was the, the positive point. He was saying, I know everything about everyone. And one of the most beautiful Psalms is Psalm 139. And uh, it's very much worth reading this to you. I think it's a very, a very powerful place. And we use these often at baby dedications. But this is what the scriptures say. He says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Remember, think about Nathaniel. He says, I, I knew about you when you were sitting at the tree. He says, you know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And so we see this, this picture of him, and, and over uh, later on in verse 13, he even talks about how him being formed in his womb in that secret place and how you ordained every uh, day for each one of us. And so suddenly we see that here in the scripture that he's telling Nathaniel, I've always known everything about you. And, and of course, if he knows the scripture, he understands that. He, he knows you know, the psalm. He knows that, that this must be the one. This must be the Messiah. And that in that moment, we begin to see in verse 48, um, something starts to take place. That he must submit to the divinity of Jesus. Just like um, Samuel did uh, when he had uh, his... The Lord kept speaking to him with Eli three different times. And finally, Eli told him who it was and to answer him. Nathaniel, look what he says in verse 49. This enters into the third thing I want you to see today is the great promise. Look what he says. Nathaniel declares, Rabbis, he says, you are the son of God. Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And so, he recognizes him as being the one, the one who reads his mail, so to speak, knowing what he's thinking, the one who reads your and my mail. He is our king and savior. He knows everything about us. And that's a word that the king, uh, savior, but king is only used a few other times. It was used in the triumphal entry uh, there on Palm Sunday, calling him king. And then the other time was when the taunters and the mockers called him the king of the Jews. And he's recognizing not only as the savior, but the king, the Lord of his life, the, the, the Lord of everyone's life. And that's what he's done. He's, he knows everything about us. Remember that. And that's not a bad thing. But because he loves us, we're going to see why that's so important. Well, notice what he says. That's the first part of the great promise. So he says to him, then Jesus says, again, he, he, he would not say this if he hadn't read Nathaniel's mail. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. Now, at that point, he called out Nathaniel on a truth, but he didn't slam him. In fact, 
if he did anything, he encouraged him. He says, you will see greater things than that. Wow. Is that not cool? He's saying this is just the beginning, Nathaniel, as a new believer. Greater things are next to come. I mean, let me tell you. In fact, verse 51, we see what he does right here. He says, then he added, he says, very truly, I tell you. Now, you got to understand in the New Testament when Jesus made, said, said those words, it was a way of saying like, amen, I'll just, just listen up now. What I'm getting ready to say is, is very important. And we're going to see that Jesus is saying, I'm the link. I'm the strongest link. You have to understand this. And he goes on. This is what he says. <laughs> I tell you, listen up. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This link between God, the strongest link. Jesus is God in the flesh. And this means that that he's saying by the, the, the realities of heaven, he says, I'm being brought down to earth. We see that in, in other scriptures, John 3, 13. And he's saying, Nathaniel, you're going to get to see this. And, and, uh, and my question or my statement is, so will you too. Nathaniel saw it. Now, yes, we know that uh, the ascension took place. But the realities of heaven are here. He saw them then, and, and, and they're here today. He's like, you know, this is a wide open heaven, and, and what you're going to be seeing is ascending and descending of angels. What he's talking about, this symbolic, um, if you will, of the whole power and the love of God, he's saying, is now, Nathaniel, it's available in the Son of Man. It's not just something that's in... We're, we're learning from the law, but it is available through the Son of Man. And he's showing himself as the Christ. And yet he's calling him the Son of Man so that he can identify with Nathaniel. And Nathaniel know that this is real. It's not just something. And, and all these, even what Isaiah promised, it had come true. Let me close with this. Uh, in a book that I'm been reading by Max Licato called Because of Bethlehem. He tells a story about when he was a little boy. And he says, you know, my, my mom and dad, uh, you know, they were, uh, my dad was um, a mechanic, I believe he said, and my mom was a nurse. She worked the second shift. And so my dad, he took care of things in the evening, you know, supper, put us to bed, and we had to be in our rooms by 9 o'clock. The only thing we could do after we went to bed was to read. So we had this big chest full of books, you know, he names different books, but underneath all the fairy tales, he, there was the book he found, and it was called A Baby in the Manger. And as he read that, he began to ask a lot of questions. And he loved the answers that he got. And in that, one of the answers that came that was most important to him was the answer, God is with us, Emmanuel. And so, of course, about Bethlehem. Without Bethlehem, we didn't have God, Emmanuel, God is with us. He said, not that God made us, not just that, not just that he thinks of us, not that just that he is above us, but that God is with us. He walked the earth, he breathed the air that we breathe, and he came. And, he, and he, as he came, he knows what it's like to be human. And here he is with Nathaniel. He's like, I know what it's like, and I'm going to show you even greater things. When, when things are going tough, I understand. I've struggled. Um, I understand all the different things that are there, but I will do greater things if you will just follow me. Will you follow him today? I promise you he will do greater things in you than you could ever imagine. It doesn't, he, always he is looking for is a submissive heart. Will you do that? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the story of, of Philip and Nathaniel. Lord, all the scriptures. But in this specific case, Lord, their simple submission to you. 
your promise to them, Lord, that you would do even greater things than what they could even comprehend. And you were already doing it in them even when they didn't realize it. Lord, you do the same for us. If you're listening to this message today, you hear the Lord knocking on the door of your heart. Simply say yes, because he wants to say, Emmanuel, I am with you. I want to walk with you. You just simply have to follow me. I, when I give you the invitation now, say, follow me, say yes, and follow him. And he will be with you the rest of your life. Lord, help us as the church to continue to follow you. Lord, and allow ourselves to be open to your moving through your Holy Spirit to do even greater things. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a great time to share his word and, the, and to fellowship in the spirit. May you go and do greater things as the Lord works in and through you. God bless you. And hey, if you made a decision today, please contact me at wbcshelby.org or reach out to a local pastor in your area or your community uh, or a trusted believer, believing friend. Thank you and have a blessed day.